corruption and institutional weaknesses uh, of um, uh, that it's experienced up till now. Uh, and now things don't look so good. Uh, you've left, uh, many reformers have been pushed out. So what, what's the basic driving force behind this setback? Um, well, difficult to answer because there are many theories. And uh, on top of the theories, there are many pr perspectives even from the insiders. You know, it de depends on who you talk to, you know. Um, some, you know, there is a polarizing perspective saying that, uh, by the way, this is oligarchic consensus coming back in, you know, the powerful people, the, the vested interest, the uh, deep state, they kind of, you know, it's a comeback, it's a very, uh, it's a very stable equilibrium, and in fact, uh, um, in fact, um, no one has ever had the chance, you know, so the deep state in Ukraine works in the following way. Uh, when a new president um, gets elected or a new team comes in, new parliament, you know, they sort of back off a little bit for a while and then they look for weaknesses and within half a year or a year, maybe a year and a half, they sort of corrupt some of the people who are, you know, weaker, start offering bribes, start offering money, uh, and then, you know, kind of business as normal, right? So, so that's, that's one argument. Uh, and many people have this argument. The other argument is more benign, more positive. Uh, it's that, you know, the team was inexperienced, young, uh, including me. We didn't know what we were doing. And unfortunately, you know, just having been good guys and uh, having good ideology and, you know, a lot of enthusiasm is not enough. Now, that perspective uh, that is, is the one which was offered, I disagree with that because, uh, you know, the... Aftermath didn't show a much better alternative. In fact, we don't see that, you know, people who presumably are more professional, you know, are doing much better. So, uh, but now, you know, these are two perspectives, you know, and I think my own perspective is that uh, it's continuation of this literalist revolutions which are happening in Ukraine. We have seen that in 2004. We have seen it in 2014. In fact, we even have seen it in 1992, if you think really about it. It's not the first change, you know, this time it was not violent, but Zelensky essentially, you know, got his 73%, it's like a revolution. This time it was through voting. Every time we are not ready as a society, every time we start figuring out where we want to take the country after this happens. Do we build a European country or do we kind of, you know, more close to Russia? Are we into, you know, are we open to pro-market liberal reforms or not, you know? Okay, we are open, then, you know, do we do them fast? What are our priorities? Or do we take them slowly, you know, and focus more on maybe uh, not markets, not business, but maybe on judicial systems? So all kinds of questions like that, we, it's every time the same thing, we start answering them. I recently talked to a friend who wor worked at the World Bank. I asked him, you know, is it typical, you know, in your experience, you know, I've been for 15 years in academia, maybe 20. You have been for 15, 20 years in uh, economic development all around the world. You know, is it typical or is it uh, different? He says, you know, what's unique about Ukraine is this roller coaster. It's either very optimistic, l things are looking, you know, great and we're moving at, you know, Imag unimaginable spits and then you know two years later it's really depressing everything is going back so you know it's just another cycle i think there is a systemic problem behind that and it's probably cultural now of course we, we can and should discuss the oligarchs the corruption the vested interests but i also think there is a cultural problem ukraine wants to change but it's a very conservative and traditional society it doesn't like change Innovation is not taught in schools. Intellectual freedom, uh, just agreement to accept a different uh, point of opinion is something which is not very common. So that provides for populists or for whoever, for deep state or whoever wants to destabilize or polarize the society, you know, plenty of opportunities to do it. You just pick up a traditional issue, start debating it and we are stuck. If you look at the civil society right now in Ukraine, everyone is fighting with everyone. And there's very little constructive agenda. Now, I think it's about to change. Maybe in a year or two, it will again look very, very optimistic. So to me, it's not the problem of Zelensky. It's a problem of this roller coaster. The question is, how do we stabilize it and how we 
not polarize, but unify the society behind the change which is needed. And in my view, it's pro-market, pro-Europe, pro-West, you know, pro-democracy. Yeah. Uh, well, let's hope. You know, uh, my center at Stanford sponsors a number of leadership programs in Ukraine, and that's certainly been my observation. I mean, we get these young, pretty liberal, pro-Western people, but they really have a hard time cooperating with one another. Uh, and that's why there hasn't been a single, you know, kind of liberal party in the, in the parliament that could offer a consistent program uh, and so forth. So that's a cultural issue, I think, that does run deep. But let me, let me just ask a little bit more specifically about how things went off the rails. So, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to reform has been the oligarch Kolomoisky. Uh, when Zelensky was first elected, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, he was close to Kolomoisky, but he's the one that has the 70% plus mandate, and he should be able to free himself uh, from that influence. But instead, Kolomoisky has managed to insinuate himself back. You know, he's got his own faction within the Servant of the People Party. How did this, how did this happen? And, and, and why, you know, for example, why had the other oligarchs not try to block this. You know, uh, Akhmetov, for example, does not get along particularly with him. I mean, why isn't there some coalition that could have stopped him from reinserting himself into, uh, you know, into presidential politics and into the parliament? Yeah, obviously, you are very, very informed and uh, you are to the point. Indeed, Kolomoisky is active in the parliament and he has, uh, okay, what I'm going to say is, I have to say that it's my subjective perception and rumors around, you know, I can't really prove it, but this is what I think currently. So he has a number of people between 40 to 45 that he controls within the servant of people. And he also has some people outside of the servant of people. And that number over time has been growing, you know. So you're correct. But at the same time, Akhmetov and others also have their own factions that uh, MPs, uh, members of parliament, who they can influence. And rumor has it that, you know, different powerful people, you know, Avakov, uh, and you can name, you know, these are people who are publicly known, but there are others who are not, uh, people like Pavluk and, you know, um, of course, there is then Medvedchuk and uh, there is Poroshenko and some of them are politicians, but some of them are behind the scenes a little bit. Um, and all of them are, you know, there's money they changing hands. Again, I cannot prove it, but uh, this is what everyone is talking about. So, you know, it's uh, a lot of people are on spot contracting, you know, they're for sale. So the question is who is will, you know, if everyone is for sale, you probably every oligarch gets a little bit of a share, you know, of course they are fighting with each other. We can see it in, you know, in TV media discussions. Um, I think the president and the political elites are interested in the balance. They don't want to, you know, make one oligarch is very powerful at the expense of others. So they're trying to balance. So that's one of the, you know, potential reasons why um, all of them are still influential. But uh, to get to the bottom of it, you know, there is a fundamental question, what to do with them, what to do with oligarchs who, in fact, are very well insulated. Um, some of them are sort of more on the positive side, you know, they're kind of constructive, they're trying to clean up their businesses, but others like Kolomoisky, their businesses are not auditable. You cannot, you know, you can never imagine that they will be able to sell their business to anyone. So for them is, uh, and plus they have all the problems with the US, in US jurisdiction, in Europe, you know, legal, uh, legal claims against them, investigations, FBI, and so on and so forth. So those guys have nothing to lose. And we know from game theory, I'm a game theorist, those who are, you know, more committed, those win. And I think Kolomoisky is just more committed. He has more to lose. He's fighting for survival. He's gambling for resurrection. And so he's much more aggressive, much more innovative, much more willing to put everything in the stake. And in that way, other oligarchs are saying, okay, wait a second, you know, do I want to be a hero? You know, yeah, I do. I do want to contain him, but do I really want to be a hero? You know, so I think there is a little bit of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I talked to a member close to to a person close to Poroshenko. Um, I think in 2019, actually, or 2018, when it still was looking that uh, okay, Kolomoisky was a trouble, but Kolomoisky was not real. You know, it's Poroshenko who was ruling at this point. And it was a member, you know, high rank member in the administration, and he said, I don't believe that Kolomoisky will disappear. He's mm -hmm. just a fighter, he controls the cows, he's a street uh, you know, player, he's a smart yeah. player, 
uh, he's just more committed and uh, he's cornered, you know, by his situation, international situation. He's going to fight until the end. And so these young, uh, inexperienced members of the Servant of the People Party uh, that people had put a lot of hope in could be corrupted by money and prestige. Oh, well, pressure, money, flattery, threats, you know, the entire arsenal of tools, you know, um, mm -hmm. some weaknesses, um, some strengths, you know, I have been approached by a number of people and I know they use different methods, you know, to approach me. Essentially, oligarchs did work with me as I was trying to be a minister. No one has met with me personally, but you know, they have different techniques, you know, and sometimes I know that some of them knew that uh, I probably wouldn't take a bribe. So, you know, some people leaked to me that they have been approached by oligarchs. So because I trust them, uh, because they want to work with me indirectly through a person I trust. So, you know, to those who they can buy, they find someone who they can influence through directly and they're not doing it for the first time, you know, that has mm -hmm. been done under Poroshenko, under Yushchenko. It, it's nothing new here. So they are masters of this game. And I think the fundamental question is what to do about this? What is the solution, you know, apart from Zelensky and everyone else? And uh, there's no easy answer because, you know, you start a fight with them. It's not clear who can take it on. You don't, then it's not clear what is the constructive way of moving beyond the zero sum game, which is currently, I think the biggest problem with them is that they still don't think that the state is, um, you know, they're not state builders. They're still not state builders. They're still uh, renters. They're still trying to suck the rents out of the state and protect what they have, you know, already have, rather than try to play into kind of common interest game of improving Ukraine. That's, I think, is a, is a major challenge too. What about uh, some of the foreign actors like the IMF and you know, let's say multinational European and American businesses that operate in Ukraine. Uh, they presumably would like to create, you know, a level playing field and um, don't like oligarchic influence. Uh, why haven't they been more powerful in trying to restrain these oligarchs? Well, you know, surprisingly, they're using the same technique. And, you know, I, the technique is to fight, you know, it's kind of us against them. Often in Ukraine, it's, you know, very strict conditionality. And uh, if you don't do that, then, you know, for example, as a minister, I was um, once presented and, you know, I'm a very pro-Western, pro-market, pro-European, you know, I kind of, uh, I've been trained by the very same people who, you know, who, who I went to the same grad schools. I went to, you know, I teach the same students that many of people who work in the IMF, the World Bank or IFIs. And so, you know, it's the same culture. I, this, I speak their language. They speak mine. And, you know, I remember that little conflict as an anecdote when um, to illustrate the problem, a person says, okay, let's put in the memorandum of the IMF. It's a rep uh, of the IMF, IMF represented, not the highest level, but, you know, local. Uh, let's have um, someone from their office, not even the country representative, insisting that we put a ban for people who own money to the either central bank or the banks to participate in privatization. And that's his personal opinion, which is, you know, you can discuss it, but it's unclear if it's constitutional. We need to prove in the courts that these people are crooks or when they committed fraud to exclude them from the ability to uh, participate in privatization. I understand they're trying to get at Kolomoisky, for example, you know, that Kolomoisky cannot uh, use the money channeled from the private bank uh, in order to now buy, let's say, Center Energo or some other, you know, major energy companies. I understand that. But it's a little bit like a using a, you know, an X when you're trying to do a surgery. Because there are, in, in fact, you know, a lot of businesses in Ukraine have NPLs, you know, accredited. You know, it was the crisis of 2008, the crisis of 2014, you name it, you know. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, okay some bad people, some good people, some okay. Maybe many of them are bad people, but it's, you know, it's not most of the country, but almost most of the country. So you're basically now going to ban everyone from prioritization. Now, and it's a very strict position and there's no discussion. And I remember then a mission comes and um, the head of the mission, I come to him to talk about this. And before I can open my mouth, he says, the answer is no. 
Now, it's a very arrogant attitude, which pisses off the cabinet of ministers there. So immediately on the personal level, you have a conflict. And then the oligarchs, you know, start kind of, mm -hmm. you know, very softly adding fire, you know, adding, adding fuel to this conflict. So I think on the personal level, there is a lot of back and forth. This is hardlining is not working. I don't believe that hard, you know, taking a very hard stance works, uh, at least worked uh, successfully. I, I think mm -hmm. it pushes a lot of officials actually back into the hands of oligarchs, uh, which is very sad. So let me ask you, uh more specifically about one of the big reforms that you attempted and uh, your experience in how that went, which is the land reform. Uh, you know, obviously freeing up agricultural land in Ukraine, I think everybody understood that this was one of the easiest gains that could, that the country could make if you could actually buy and sell land uh, freely, but it was also one of the most controversial ones for a number of historical and cultural reasons, and you also had these really big, you know, interests, organized interests arrayed against it. Can you just talk a little bit about um, what you were attempting to do, how much you think you accomplished, and, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't enough, what, what stood in the way of doing that? Okay, great. This is uh, perhaps is the reform uh, which I was interested in, and this was a major you know, when um, at that point to about to be appointed Prime Minister Hanchuruk talked to me about becoming a Minister of uh, Economy and Agriculture, you know, that was a major interest for me. That was the reason that I joined. I thought, guys, you know, for 10 years, we cannot create a basic uh, market. You know, 45% uh, of our export is agriculture. We don't have a free market for land, you know, with all restrictions, of course, we just don't, we can trade. People own land, but you know, it's really trade is all in shadow, you know, substitute kind of forms of property ownership. There's no credit market to it, you know, attached. You cannot use it as collateral. There are no incentives to develop, you know, very myopic approach, very myopic perspective. We have to change it. It's a major driver for growth, you know. And I was very happy when the prime minister and the president said, you know, this is a priority number one. This is, you know, we expect, you know, that the, there were forecasts that it would add two or three percent of uh, growth to, um, to, to G GDP growth per year, you know, at least in second to third year, you know. So that was a driver. So that looked all good. I, you know, accepted this. I said, that's going to be the major reform. And two weeks in the office, we push out to the cabinet, you know, the, the legislation on the land market reform. And the way it works, the cabinet would have to approve it and then submit to the parliament and, you know, it goes. So within three weeks, the cabinet approves it and we push it. And after that, it gets stuck. It got stuck in the parliament. And actually, I think we are the only ones who kept it to the schedule. Because the president, the prime minister, myself and others developed a timeline, you know, like a project management. What needs to be done, you know, in first week, second week and so on until. So we kept our, uh, you know, side of the bargain. We did it. But even when we were pushing it to the prime ministers, to the cabinets, or, you know, to the cabinets for a vote, there were already a lot of, you know, this uh, kind of little bureaucratic hiccups and things, you know, sort of, you know, let's wait, let's discuss, let's what if, what about, you know, this uh, just don't rush. Let's, we need to make it, uh, you know, we may need to make certain. So, you know, this uh, the vested interest start derailing it. Uh, by using the bureaucracy to slow down your process. That's the first attempt. Now, we have been, you, you can overcome that. And that's why you still, you know, kind of have a chance. But once it got in the, in the parliament, then, um, you know, the committees and there were thousands of amendments, filibusters de facto, and the parliament didn't want to overrun it. You know, for political reasons, you know, some, some of the politicians who are kind of, you know, eye in the future after Zelensky, um, the, you know, some who are just conservative uh, or trying to be balanced, uh, um, they decided, you know, there is no need to rush. And I think that's when somewhere in the end of October and end of November last year, that's where the reform started slowing down. And once the vested interests see that, okay, this is working, actually, we managed to scare a sufficient number of MPs, then, you know, then they get encouraged and then it's done. Um, in particular, you know, guys uh, were do, you know, some of the members of parliaments were getting threats individually or their families in their villages were getting threats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's coordination. People got scared that we're moving a little bit too fast, but I think that's the way to do it. You know, move fast through while you still have power 
Once you slow down, then it's done. We slowed down. And then in the end, it's almost completely derailed. Uh, you know, it uh, got postponed by a year. Legal entities are not allowed. There's major restrictions, not more than 100 hectares. We can discuss and debate what is the right restriction, but in the end, we're getting nothing. So I think the reform is still going through. The president today made an announcement uh, that the land will be you know, at least the management of state land will be transferred to local communities, which in my view is a great idea. Uh, but, you know, you just need to move fast. Now I'm convinced that at least in Ukraine, you should not allow yourself to have any doubt. You you pick a course, you do it, uh, because half a year or a year from, from your you know appointment, you don't have any ability to do anything. So just slow down, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's good advice, I think, uh, for a lot of reformers. Uh, if you look uh, into the future, wh what you said earlier was actually hopeful that you've had this constant seesawing between um, going backwards and going forwards, and there might be opportunities that will arise, you know, for another go at reform. What would your priorities be uh, in terms of things that you needed to fix? Obviously. A second attempt to do the land reform properly would be one of them, but there's other issues. There's a big problem in the constitutional court and the fight that they're having now over, you know, anti-corruption and the anti-corruption court. There's a big problem in the gas reform, you know, trying to undermine the board of NAFTA gas and, and, and so forth. Uh, if you had to set priorities for you know, so lots of things that need to be fixed in Ukraine. What, where would you spend your political capital uh, in the future? Excellent question, because even in the constitutional court, I think there are at least five major challenges. You mentioned anti-corruption institution, but there's also e-declaration. There is land market, you know, you name it. Um, the corporate governance is under attack. The National Bank is in the middle of scandal. The budget process is a bit derailed. So, you know, you're at this time of kind of um, the beginning of a cycle of where you can go down and create a major structural imbalances uh, in Ukrainian economy, which will later generate a crisis. It will be a bit delayed. So, you know, there are two opportunities or two scenarios, I would say, if there is a, you know, when the new wave comes. If it comes as a result of a major economic crisis, because of the structural imbalances which can accumulate over the next several years or even faster, you know, no IMF program, no World Bank, you know, it depends, but you can accumulate it. Ukraine has been there many times. Other countries have been there many times. So I think the priority then will be, unfortunately, again, macroeconomic stabilization. And that's your standard, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy, um, budget uh, process, you know, you need to clean that up. But imagine, um, that's a pessimistic scenario, and unfortunately, it's a realistic scenario. But uh, unfortunately, uh, imagine you in a, in a better world. You know, all this macroeconomic stability, which has been fought for uh, under Poroshenko and under Zelensky too, is not destroyed. And you actually get a window when, for whatever exogenous or endogenous reasons, the economy is looking okay. What should be, let's say, three priorities? Infrastructure. That's railroads, ports, uh, roads, but not in general way, let's build a road from school to a village, but let's build a road from a plant to a port, you know, uh, because that's actually a binding constraint on economic development. Uh, when I was a minister, it was clear that this is very binding, uh, that um, some of the metallurgy plants were, for example, uh, you know, it was optimal for them to export raw ore, uh, and they were, you know, burning it into metal, uh, losing some money, at least given the current market prices, because they didn't have the capacity to export because the railroad was, uh, you know, was, didn't have enough um, trains, essentially. Uh -huh. you know, so that's, that's actually a very pragmatic thing, which can help economy right now. Second one, of course, is modernization. It has to be a priority investment. It could be foreign directness, a law, you know, the, whatever. But we have about uh, our uh, capital depletion is at 60%. And again, in infrastructure, sometimes it comes up to 98%. And we only have a couple of industries like our IT and agriculture, where this comparable to, let's say, Poland or Slovakia, you know, neighboring countries at 35 to 40%. So we are really, we have really depleted our capital. Now, that's on the immediate reforms. You know, of course, modernization, it comes with, uh, you know, you need some climate, right? And so now immediately we're attaching legal reform. You know, if we don't get uh, courts operational, 
we can try whatever we want. So I think these are the three priorities, direct investment in cleanup of infrastructure and here roads, railroads and ports, and then uh, investment climate, but we need to work not just with uh, regulations and deregulations, but essentially courts. So this is three reforms. If I were to think a little bit more fundamentally, I think as we discussed, there is a culture problem that uh, Ukrainians are you know, very conservative and um, we, we lost that basis, at least for the economy, or that we can write our conservatism. Our economy is not strong enough to allow us to be conservative. We have to innovate. So we're talking about high school reform. We are talking about universities. So education has to change. It has to start teaching higher level cognitive and uh, social skills, soft skills, such as debating, creative uh, uh, abilities, critical thinking, and so on and so forth. Ability to apply knowledge, not just to memorize it. So that's needed. Then, of course, the other two are medical and pension. You know, healthcare reform can, has to continue, has to be you know, changed, but has to continue. And of course, uh, pension, because if we don't solve the problem with pensions somehow, we're going to be bankrupt as the country and we are gonna, um, we're going to feed populism. We're going to grow populism. Things will be only getting worse. So we need to do something about pension reform and we need to do something about health care. I think we are going to need to move towards questions and answers soon. But let me just ask you, following on your last point, how you think the COVID epidemic, which as I understand is getting a lot worse in Ukraine, uh, will affect the general uh, outlook for the country, for the, the economic health of the country? Well, the government manipulated the criteria. In August and September, there were two meetings of the, uh, of the cabinet where they changed the criteria so that don't uh, kind of impose lockdowns in certain areas. The consequences mm -hmm. of that is higher rates. The reasons for that probably, you know, I can only guess I wasn't in the meetings, uh, and sometimes even being in the cabinet meetings, you don't know the true reasons, but you know, I only can guess that it's because of local elections which are happening on the 25th of October. So no one wanted to piss off mayors or give them ammunition um, to claim that you know, all the bad things in economy are happening because of the lockdown imposed by the national government. So as a result of that, uh, the Kiev School of Economics, where I'm also president, runs estimates. We have run models. We actually work with the government on uh, modeling and providing criteria, suggesting criteria. I think our estimates that we increase the number of deaths expected by the end of the year five times. Um, yeah, five times from 4,000. We're a smaller country, so for, from 4,000 to 20,000. But even with 20,000, you know, it's a still, you know, if we compare it to the United States or some other countries, you know. Um, the situation is bad, but not as bad as could potentially be. Some of our estimates are the models show up to 150,000, you know, so that can also happen if, if thing. So that's one thing that's on the medical part. But of course, politically, there is a lot of pressure uh, not to have any lockdowns. The population doesn't want it. The economy is weak. People want to have jobs and surveys continue to show that, you know, economy wins over in terms of, um, you know, sub political support or political demands uh, of the public over uh, safety, you know, over health. Uh, but on macroeconomic level, there is a good and bad news. It's always two-sided, you know. Uh, the crisis somehow is helping us. You know, it's, of course, we're being hurt, but we're not being hurt as much as we could have. For example, uh, our agricultural experts, they didn't shrink that much because the global demands for agriculture actually are not shrinking. So some of our experts, IT is the same. For our IT companies, yes, they have to restructure, they have to adjust, but uh, the demand for IT services is not globally shrinking. In fact, it's increasing because of the need to respond to COVID. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of our industries, which are major drivers of uh, our growth, they're doing well or reasonably okay. At the same time, the imports dropped. Why? Because, you know, the domestic demand is shrinking, partly because of uncertainty, partly because of unemployment, so on. So there are behavioral re responses. So demand is being delayed. So our, you know, balance of payments, you know, uh, trade uh, balance and so on, they're improving. So that also helps to stabilize or keep uh, reserves of the National Bank, despite all the issues that we're having with the IMF. Um, the exchange rate is uh, stable, relatively plus minus, you know, you can talk about it, but it's minor, you know. So so we're doing fine macroeconomically. That actually, at the same time, we are getting these political imbalances and some structural economic imbalances which are being accumulated, but they are being masked from the public 
by this COVID uh, macroeconomic effects for um, given the specifics of the Ukrainian economy. So I think uh, the good news is that we are doing fine. The bad news is that uh, it helps us to hide our imbalances and politicians do not feel immediate pressure to respond to them. So we're accumulating problems. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the beginning of that roller coaster, you know. Right. Okay, so uh, in the audience, I encourage you to put questions in the chat and I, I will try to pose them. Uh, we have several already. So uh, one of them is, uh, which reform do you believe is the most effective one that's happened since uh, 2014, since the revolution of dignity? What's the biggest achievement? Macroeconomic stabilization, I think. That's the biggest achievement. Uh, I, I put it as, as um, you know, it's actually three separate reforms. It's the monetary policy and oversight of the banking system in the National Bank. This is a proper budgeting process uh, where the budget is being used more efficiently and, you know, there's less corruption in the budget. And of course, uh, and there are fiscal, you know, fiscal uh, consolidation goes there. And then uh, we start cleaning up state-owned companies. You know, Nafta Gas is very different. That's not the company which can bankrupt us. In fact, it started being profitable. We start corporatization of other big companies and, you know, some of it is on the way. So these are the major things. So once again, uh, macroeconomic stabilization, which is achieved because of fiscal monetary and corporate governance of the state property aspects. Of course, there's been a bit of an assault on the central bank. Do you think it's going to survive as an institution? I mean, the reformed version of the there's central been bank? An assault, uh, there's been an assault on a, every of these three directions. Uh, mm -hmm. On the national bank, uh, although the policy is not being assaulted, uh, but the team and you know has been assaulted. And the rumor has it that uh, both Roshkov and Sologub, the last remaining two warriors from the from Gontar Vasmali team, will be ousted in, you know, very shortly, you know, in the next uh, mm -hmm. several days, maybe. And now there's a public conflict, you know, between. So we'll see. I, I, it doesn't look good, you know. The, when um, yeah. the the leadership of the central bank is fighting openly, openly that we can speak about it, you know, using specific names, and they fight on the uh, panels uh, or calls for investors, you know, it doesn't look good. They say the budget process is derailed too, very problematic, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> requests from different vested interests, uh, you know, unclear strategic priorities. Uh, so the Minister of Finance is fighting there. We'll see if he or what can, he can deliver. And then the corporate governance of the companies, you know, state-owned companies. So all of this. So I think, um, you know, I'm, I, I think we'll be muddling through. So the the sort of assault will continue, it will be gradual, things will continue to fall apart because of political infighting uh, until there is a change, you know, that's this uh, roller coaster kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. Things okay, have there's... to get worse before they get better, that's what I think. Uh, there's another question about how uh, you th successfully you thought you were in communicating uh, your reforms to the broader public and building support for them. Well, good question. So, you know, uh, actually a very important question. As the minister, I think, uh, I, at least I viewed my job as having three pillars. One of them is actually the content of the reform. The second one is uh, continuing to maintain political will or political coalition or some resemblance of it or, you know, doing the best you can uh, in order to support this reform. And the third one is communicating this reform to the public and discussing it with the public. Now, I think it's almost impossible in the current media environment for the government to communicate anything. Look at the ownership of TV channels. You know, some of them are owned by Medvedchuk, pro-Russian, you know, kind of group. Some of them are owned by Pinchuk. Some of them are owned by Akhmetov. You know, you can have different opinions, but these are, you know, these are guys with serious businesses and they have very specific interests. And the moment someone steps on their toes, they immediately, you know, you, you can sense it immediately in the, in the coverage, you know. We can think social networks can uh, overcome that. Well, no, they can't. Um, civil society, well, marginal when we talk about the public, the general public. So I think um, one of the major issues is that the media are captured, not only the government. So communication is difficult in the captured media environment. You have to be innovative. You can do things. Uh, but uh, definitely, you know, if you objectively judge me in communication of the land market reform, no, we were not successful. 
So there's a question from Peter Rutland. Uh, Ukraine has tried to get to Denmark, but doesn't seem to be getting there. Is there a second best strategy uh, that would seek a more realistic uh, goal than, than what you've tried in the past? I, so can you repeat the first part of the sentence? Ukraine tried to get to... To Denmark. Well, <laughs> getting to Denmark... I'm not quite sure I understand that, what it means. Well, Maybe it's, it's uh, actually a phrase I used in one of my books. Uh, okay, okay. Denmark, so are my apologies. Denmark is an uncorrupt, you know, successful com country. And this is the model for a lot of reformers. They want to be like Denmark. And you're clearly not Denmark. So the question then is... Uh, well, the question... There, mm -hmm. The question, so the question is, was there an alternative strategy that could have been followed that would have gotten you further along? Well, the question is, have we ever tried, really? I don't think we have. Mm -hmm. I don't think no one in the leadership was truly willing to sacrifice their political future to, you know, for some principles. And that applies both to President Zelensky, to President Poroshenko, to President Yushchenko, to President Yanukovych, to Lasso, you know, and we can go all the way. I don't think a we have had yet a leader who was willing to, you know, for whom principles were more important than staying in power. So I, so I think given that we have not really tried, but what can be done better had I, you know, I think the proper question would be, what have I done had I had, you know, time machine to move back one year? Mm -hmm. I would have been much more aggressive and much more focused. I would have just ignored the tons of minor things. And I would just focus on the three reforms, liberalization of labor markets, privatization, and land market, and push them as hard as I did land market. And in half a year, try to pass all the laws and ignore the rest. I would just tell to the prime minister and to the president, the, you know, do whatever you want. I'm focusing on these three reforms. I am not spreading my attention all over things. So structural reforms very fast, very, you know, small focus. I think that's the problem both for Zelensky and Poroshenko. They are trying to do, you know, 56 priorities at once. Uh, so there's another question about um, Western influence um, that a lot of times it's come in the form of, you know, Biden lecturing the prosecutor uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, I guess the question is, why doesn't the West try to use its... Um, soft power better to do things like funding universities and programs uh, and, and so forth, rather than these more direct policy uh, um, interventions. Uh, well, you know, I also think that's a similar problem. People need results now, in, even if they're officers of, uh, you know, international organizations, um, you know, they're their career path, you know, they have a fight, you know, I've had a case of a major officer of a major IFI pushing us to put, uh, you know, to pass certain laws uh, by January of certain year uh, because he or she was getting a different appointment, you know. So the person wanted uh, to have a clear case and a reform on his track, on his record, not on... Uh, and that was going into all kinds of memoranda things. So, you know, this is standard career uh, concern problems you are having. And there's, of course, issues with coordination of all of them and uh, things like that. Yeah. But uh, I think the priorities changed. People need results right now. And I, I also think, you know, it's very frustrating for me, me being involved in Kiev School of Economics, trying to build it, seeing how the priorities went from financing education into financing, you know, now it's just uh, three months programs, you know, for many cases, a lot of money being wasted by international consultants who basically are helicopter consultants. Uh, but you know, this is what it is. No one owns Ukraine a dollar. And if you want to have an honest uh, answer, I don't think the West or the South or Russia or, you know, people from Mars can help Ukraine. In that sense, yeah, resources are there, but the problems are truly full internal political structural problems in Ukraine, and Ukraine needs to find a way. Um, I don't think the IMF or the World Bank or the United States government somehow can reform Ukraine if Ukraine doesn't know what it wants to right. do. Right. Well, that's certainly been my theory of change. Uh, you know, I think giving policy advice or trying to intervene. Um, more directly from the United States is just a hopeless and, and counterproductive activity. And that's why in my center, we focused on building these leadership programs, uh, you know, to train a new generation of Ukrainians that hopefully one day will 
be able to take responsibility uh, for their own uh, for their own country. And I think, you know, the Kiev School of Economics uh, also got a lot of foreign assistance, right, in terms of setting the faculty up and, uh, you know, turning it into a, you know, very high quality institution. I was actually, my first trip to Kiev was actually at the school's founding, I believe back in 2005, was it? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that was a important contribution where people from the West, you know, made, uh, made some effort to help. Uh, so we have another question about how you would evaluate uh, Zelensky as president. Well, it's a broad, open-ended question, I think. Um, he's currently losing support. Uh, he has made, you know, on a tactical level, a very smart, brilliant move um, within the kind of uh, modern culture of uh, ignoring the rules um, and breaking the precedents uh, by, uh, you know, there are local elections in uh, on October 25th, and he's going to ask five questions. It's not like a referendum, but almost like a referendum. And so far, he's asking the right questions, you know, what to do with corruption, what to do with education, you know, and so on, right? Uh, what to do with Donbass. Um, and uh, he's a peacekeeper. He sees himself as a person who is a very centrist and trying to uh, unify the country. I think that's not enough, unfortunately, because there's an also an issue of execution. Uh, and once you get to execution, you get a lot of different vested interests pulling it apart. So I think uh, it will continue to be the battle between good intentions and difficulties with execution. And um, similar to Poroshenko uh, and to every president in Ukraine previously, there is a dark and a kind of, you know, good and a bad side to it, you know, um, to every president. I think different uh, type of people are fighting for the opinion or for the, you know, kind of access to president, you know, people representing me, but also, you know, some pretty corrupt people. Um, and this battle continues, which one will win? Um, it's unclear. Uh, unfortunately, often it's not the, you know, it's more reactionary forces which win in the end. But uh, my view is that um, the execution is, you know, if the president can overcome the challenge of executing of his ideas, he would be able to bring back his popularity and deliver. However, if uh, he cannot, uh, then his support will, will continue to drop. Okay, I think we probably have time for just one more uh, question. Um, uh, there's a question about what can be done uh, in Ukraine to deal with uh, oligarchs and their media power that doesn't involve uh, restrictions on um, basically freedom of speech. Is there anything that can be done? Actually, I'm in favor now, that's gonna be very unpopular of some restriction of freedom of speech. Because, you know, I, I, I'm going to write a paper showing that some of TV shows and adversarial debating, if properly framed, actually discourages critical thinking. So I think we need to start, think it's happening all over the world and we need to start thinking uh, clearly or, or carefully about what it means, what we censor and what we don't and how we find the balance. Because clearly we have examples of censoring things, you know, for instance, you cannot curse, you know, on TV in Ukraine, you know, you, your license will be, or you cannot advocate against, you know, uh, uh, lies, you know, you cannot advocate against COVID or you cannot argue that COVID is some kind of conspiracy theory, you know, you can lose a license for that if you are doing damage, you know, and you can see that Facebook and Twitter started, uh, you know, censoring some political posts, even of presidents of the leading countries, you know, including the United States. So that issue is there. We need to think, you know, we cannot just say what we can do. I think uh, to, you have to approach it from the perspective of censorship or regulations. And you also have to approach from the, per, from the perspective of the ownership. But that's a policy question. Once you have a policy question, you have a political economy question, because this is actually the real, the kind of last mile protection of the oligarchs. Given that they often control sufficient number of votes in the parliament to be able to stop it, any legislation from being passed. Will they be able to reconsider or change the legislation that suddenly they lose this protection? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think uh, TV is more important for oligarchs than uh, members of parliament. You know, and it's actually easier to get a member of parliament if you have TV. We have seen evidence from Latin America on, you know, on TV being the most highly bribed, uh, um, you know, uh, officials, right? 
So I think it's, it's a very challenging question. I hope there will be alternatives. And I think the, the proper alternative is, uh, of course, civil society. But civil society has to grow up and start talking not only to itself, but also to general public. Start to talk about issues which concern people, let's say, in villages, you know, uh, and, you know, drop this elitist perspective. I think so the most effective answer to that is to grow new generations of uh, opinion leaders, but they have to become uh, um, not, uh, you know, they have to stop being elitists. Right. Okay, so I guess the last final question is, would you go back into government if you had another chance? Well, you know, whenever I'm asked this question, or I'm asked another question, even the night before the appointment, whether I am being considerate or would I agree, I always, you know, to be a minister, that was a year ago, I always say no. You know, publicly, I always say no. Uh, in practice, you know, it depends on the conditions. You know, for me, the most important thing is if I can make a difference, if I can leave a mark on the development of Ukraine and whether it is more effective to do it now or later and in what position. So again, the, here the question will come down to, to execution. If I feel that we can do structural reforms and they actually will get done and there is a possibility that, that, yes, of course. If the answer is no, you know, it's good for your career, but you will be stuck, then what's the point? Okay, well, I hope the opportunity comes for you and, you know, many of the other reformers that have been driven out of the current uh, government. And let's hope that the roller coaster keeps, uh, keeps rolling. Uh, so, Jen, uh, do you want to come back and... Make yes. some remarks. No, this was, uh, we're really just grateful uh, for the both of you for taking time for this. Uh, these are really hard questions, and uh, I'm glad I wasn't the one having to ask them to you, Timothy. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so thanks to both of you for being with us today, um, and we'll look forward to continuing this conversation in the months and weeks to come, and we'll look forward to following your trajectory, Timothy. Thank you very much. And thanks, Thank Professor Fukuyama. All right. Take care. Okay, bye -bye. See you all soon. Bye-bye.